Thank you, Beth, and uh, such an honor to have you here, Nigel, and, and hear about your thoughts. Uh, um, you know, in the emerging worlds, uh, we want to think about billion dollar problems that could impact a billion lives. And it used to be that we used to think about, oh, emerging worlds, you know, let's see how we can save lives and, you know, distribute mosquito nets or, 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 or aid. And then we said, oh, these are great markets. How do we exploit them? But I think we are in a new era where we had to think about true partnerships on how we move forward in, in emerging worlds. Because, you know, we're going to get care without going to hospitals, and we're going to learn without building schools. Uh, we're going to grow food, as you saw, uh, without relying on farms. And we're going to transact in currencies that are not even mandated by the government. And that's happening much faster in emerging worlds than it may be happening at other places. And earlier we heard about, uh, heard from Raghavan about smart citizens, digital citizens. And I feel that even before smart cities, even before cities are getting smart, the citizens are, 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 are smart already. So I think we have an opportunity to start thinking about uh, a lot of these bottom-up efforts uh, that will completely transform the cities even before uh, you know, many cities, especially in emerging worlds, can get their act together or have the capacity or funding or, or skills to build smart cities. So we have this really amazing opportunity uh, to think about smart citizens first. And when it comes to venturing, you know, Gordon Morris says that, and as you'll see in emerging worlds, you know, there are ways to make impact. You know, the two traditional ways have been kind of startup ventures and corporate ventures that interact with the government. Um, and now we have a new era of hybrid ventures, and you'll see how, how uh, we are stimulating that. And Esther Duflo and, and Professor Banerjee talk about, hey, what's a supply-driven innovation versus a demand-driven innovation? And should we do this innovation uh, by, uh, when they're self-evident, or should we do kind of randomized A-B trials? Um, and I think, as Nigel said, sometimes you just get started, because if you start doing A-B trials, uh, you, know, you spend a lot of time doing analysis that may lead to knowledge, but maybe not wisdom. So, you know, that's why we want to think about, you know, beyond big data, beyond Internet of Things, beyond newly digital citizens, on how, you know, so research we do in emerging worlds can really leapfrog any of the linear thinking uh, that we can imagine. So, you know, I just want to kind of put this up because, you know, we try to apply the models that we learn in Boston, right? So I would say Boston is kind of solver rich. You know, we have enough talent, and Nigel, you yourself have a computer science degree, and it's amazing to have you as part of the government. So we're kind of you know, spoiled here with a lot of talent. Um, and maybe we are not even working on problems that really matter because we have so much talent. Um, but the rest of the world doesn't have this luxury. There are lots of problems, but maybe not enough solvers to go tackle them. So simply cannot take the way things work here uh, in Boston or any solver-rich environment, uh, and apply them. So, you know, traditional models of venture funding, venture capitalists, startups, incubators, accelerators, hackathons are simply not enough uh, to make a dent. So, and the other axis is what type of innovation, incremental or, or, or disruptive. You know, if I, if I know how to build hotels uh, in an in a emerging market, if I build two, I know how to build a third one. Uh, but if you want to do true innovation that uses all of the things that you know, Nigel and our colleagues were talking about earlier, uh, you know, like, like Bitcoin or machine learning or microfluidics or new nano analysis, you just have to go and be brave enough to bring those innovative technologies with us as well. And that's what we're for, uh, targeting for in the emerging worlds. Impact innovation that can apply in not so solver rich world. <clears throat> and then we have this uh, another challenge where on the left we have kind of a lot of curiosity and community building, you know, academic research, research labs, hackathons and contests. And on the right, we want to make an impact. And we think that somehow, you know, folks will kind of bridge this gap, uh, you know, through some incentives or competitions and, and, and some funding and so on. It turns out that is very difficult to achieve in a, a problem-rich and solver-poor world. And that's where... Uh, as Beth was talking about earlier, we have this notion of spotting a problem, probing a solution, growing an adoption, and, and see how we can launch. <clears throat> the key to remember here is that the same people may not be part of every process. It's not like a startup where the founders somehow magically come up with the, just the right problem, just the right solution, and have the right plan. We're going to work together uh, to make this happen. And that's the philosophy behind Redux, rethinking engineering design and execution. 
and you're welcome to kind of go online, redx.io, to see how we're looking at this from building clubs, which are, which are uh, you know, uh, communities that think about major problems, you know, very much like what Nigel was showing for the, for the you know, the, the community events. Um, it's a 10-week program, online, offline, Redx Labs, and there are about six of them. Uh, we heard earlier from, from Lakshmi uh, of a lab in, in Nasik, and also Redx Fund, we can talk about that later. <clears throat> and my friend Ajay Bora says, you know, analysis leads to knowledge, but only synthesis leads to wisdom. And so the only way to do this is to actually try it out. You know, get your hands dirty and be part of the ecosystem. That's what we believe in. So uh, Lakshmi talked earlier about Digital Impact Square, just a beautiful place looking at you know, transport, looking at crime, looking at uh, you know, agriculture and, and, and uh, fish stocks. Um, there are lots of opportunities out there that are impacting communities, like hawkers, you know, informal sector. Um, and, and May, who leads the USAID lab, uh, says if you want to create a sandbox, uh, for open innovation, it needs five things, right? Of course, you need open innovation. Uh, you need evidence-based and iterative. You have to fail fast, but think big. Uh, you need scale and persistence. It's not something you can try for six months or a year. You have to keep going on it for three to five years before all the relationships are built, before people understand what's going on, and they are inspired to do something that's highly lucrative financially, but also has a high impact. Because you can either get folks who are passionate, or you can get folks who have skills but getting both at the same time is very challenging. You need an urban technology and most important partnerships, and that's why we are here. And then Kent Larson, uh, you know, uh, my friend and, and colleague as part of the Emerging Worlds Consortium, um, you know, is very honest about what's needed to get this done, right? You need leadership in those sandboxes. So like, if you think about NASIC, where Digital Impact Square is, we need leadership, we need important problems to work on, uh, we need a local liaison uh, or an organization, uh, we need access to data. This is very critical. Um, and when Nigel was talking about earlier, you know, I think I hope everybody will follow that model. Uh, should be able to work with industry uh, in the in the ecosystem. And you know, just being honest, you need some funding for that to happen uh, at MIT as well. So some of the things we're looking at moving forward uh, in emerging worlds are things like how can we have a street address for everyone? You know, 80% of the world's roads don't have a name, which means that these folks are disconnected from majority of uh, you know, digital ecosystem, whether it's e-commerce or credits or property rights or even calling for an ambulance in an emergency. You know, they have to call and say, hey, I'm behind this bank, third right, and you'll see a brown house. <clears throat> uh, we're thinking about variables, and earlier we heard about uh, from Joe Paradis' group about thinking about new types of variables, but what if we can create a $1 variable? You, know, you can get something like you know, uh, track R or, or, or tile app. Does anybody have those things? A tile app, which allows you to, you know, those things you can buy online for about $2. Uh, those things are sold for $30. Uh, uh, but you can buy those things, you know, knockoffs at $2, and they work pretty well. So we are at a regime where we can create, you know, mass use technologies. We had mainframes, we had, you know, desktops, we have mobiles, you know, maybe it's wearables, but you can actually bring them in a way that even the folks who are not completely digital in their lifestyle can start getting benefits of a digital ecosystem. Uh, we're thinking about Siri in any regional language. Can I just press a button and create a NLP and voice rec and information play in any regional language in the world, right? Um, and how can we create solutions for health, like low vision? So um, emerging worlds are looking at many digital innovations uh, using tools like wearables, uh, cameras, uh, you know, thinking about or unorganized sector, and many tools, and I think only through true collaboration uh, we'll be able to make uh, a dent here. So uh, I really want to thank everyone for coming here to join for Emerging Worlds. Uh, this is just kind of a, um, a, a, uh, an open session. Uh, we're going to spend the next few days working with our members in the Emerging Worlds uh, ecosystem and working very closely with them about some new projects, some new directions, finding the right talent, finding the right partners, uh, working with many PIs, uh, many um, investigators uh, in the Media Lab, at MIT, and uh, in the community. So the only way we're going to leapfrog is by exponential thinking. Thank you. Again, thank you, everybody. We're, we're all done.
So if you want to have conversations with anybody, we'll, we'll um, you know, we, we can um, meet outside or, or up front here for a few more minutes. So thank you all for coming. And um, feel free to email me if you have any questions or, or comments or you'd like to conclude, um, you know, or provide any suggestions or what have you. Thanks again. <laughs>